Audiobook Title Mix Audiobook Collection 150 System vs. Rebirth Chapter 760 Progress The second limitation is the spirit link. Even though I said that this ability could create a spirit link, it wouldn't be possible if your body didn't have a spirit link in the first place. You could say that your body had to understand the spirit link first before being able to attempt this. Anna was stupefied. The requirement was extremely hard. There might be some humans that could reach this level, but each kingdom wouldn't have more than five people. It was no wonder why Old Rue taught them without any care. Still, how do you know our conversion rate and the spirit link? I simply read your spiritual energy frequency. Old Rue smiled while adding inwardly, the girl is extremely dangerous. 95% conversion rate and a spirit link. It seems that her spirit link is extremely solid as well. Her talent is above my grandson, who only has a 90% conversion rate and a spirit link. However, the terrifying one is Noel. He has a conversion rate of 100%. There is a spirit link in his body, but it feels like half completed. I have never encountered an incomplete spirit link, but if I have to guess, it seems that this spirit link is completed. The only reason why it looks incomplete is because there is another spirit residing in his body. In addition, that spirit is taking precisely half of his body, meaning that spirit also has a 100% conversion rate. In other words, Noel has two spirits with a 100% conversion rate and potentially two spirit links. His name will surely go down in history. Old Rue didn't know that if he didn't have Ardagon, he couldn't get this opportunity. However, Old Rue also noticed the speed of his growth. It was less than Anna, but the more time passed, the more refined his ability became. Old Rue didn't know that Noel had yet to complete the training task, which would allow him to be more sensitive to energy, increasing his training speed further. If he knew about it, he would probably expel him from here, unable to take it in his heart. Now that I have managed to do it, what should I do? Anna asked while pointing to his other hand. Should I do two at the same time? Yes, you will have to reach the full body eventually. So, it's better for you to start early. Anna nodded without hesitation. Although she could wait for Noel here, she didn't hesitate to proceed, completely believing Noel was able to catch up. Of course, Noel had been listening while training. He finally understood the reason for his training which made him more fired up. It was no wonder why he could catch up to Anna in the past life. This ability would definitely play a huge part in it. On top of that, he also planned to get the true spirit body for both spirits. He didn't know what would happen at that time, but this true spirit body would definitely give two different kinds of power, allowing him to make his opponent unable to get used to his power. Noel took a deep breath and continued with his training. After another three hours, Noel managed to cover his hand with this thin layer of skin. I have finished my first task. Noel opened his mouth, showing the result. That's good enough. Old Rue nodded after observing the outer layer. He glanced at the sky and said, There are about two more hours before sunset. You can continue if you want. Since you've succeeded, you should be able to do the rest by yourself. I'm going to prepare your food. Thank you, Old Rue. Noel politely bowed. There was no obligation for Old Rue to accept them. Yet, he actually did so much for them. He didn't know how to thank him. It's fine, if you want to thank me. Do me a favor before you depart. That's enough. Old Rue waved his hand with a smile. I understand. Noel nodded. After Old Rue returned to the cabin, Noel took a peek at Anna's progress. As expected of Anna, she managed to cover both shoulders already. It seemed that once she knew the trick, she could proceed at a far faster speed. If this continued, she would have cleared the first hurdle which was to envelop the whole body with this layer of spiritual energy and that was where the serious training would begin. Noel only managed to cover an entire right arm after another two hours. His progress might not be as good as Anna, but his pace gradually became faster. After all, this training allowed Noel to actually adapt to his spirit link. Heisk had given him the spirit link, increasing his spiritual energy sensitivity. The training task should also be related to Heisk. And with this training, he could finally make full use of it. It was awkward at first, considering the first time he tried it. The surge of energy caused a shockwave and knocked him down, but the more he used it, the higher his mastery became. If this continued, he should be able to catch up to Anna within three to four days. Hugh, Noel took a deep breath, feeling a bit exhausted. How is it? 
it seems that you've made good progress. Anna smiled, checking his condition. Yeah, however, I'm not going to lose against you. Noel smirked. Is that so? I won't be pulling my punch, you know. Ha <laughs> ha, we can decide once we go back to our room. Maybe I will hinder you. Noel had a mischievous grin on his face. How about a bet? Huh? Interesting. The loser will have to say one line that the other party wanted. Huh? One line? Noel tilted his head in confusion. The bet looked small at first glance, but he soon realized that she could force Anna to say she loved females to Nicole, causing a ruckus among the Stargaze family. It seemed that the bet wasn't that small either. Noel and Anna grinned, feeling excited. We have a deal. Weapon seller in the world of magic. Chapter 424 Lan Jinia and Shang Wen at Mount Lan Roughly around 10 o'clock, Shang Wen and Lan Jinia made it to Mount Lan. Lan Jinia asked him to stay at the foot of the mountain as she intended to battle against the Zheng to get back her daughter, but as the second prince insisted on following her due to worry about her safety, she decided to knock him out in case of an emergency. Amara, the giant flying stingray, the emperor's mount, made its way to the top of the mountain. There. They have the Zheng waiting in its original form, looking at the five-tailed scarlet leopard. The six-circle realm flying stingray was frightened and refused to make its landing, but then, as the Zheng spoke to it in a human tongue, not wanting to see Lan Jinia getting carried by Shang Wen if the latter was a stepson, the king-grade beast reluctantly landed on the mountain but made sure to avoid the Zheng's gaze. Meanwhile, Shang Wen turned wary of the beast emperor. He felt like this opponent is far stronger than he imagined. He decided not to battle it but instead put his entire focus on how to quickly grab his mother and fly away without caring about Tamara. Welcome to my abode, Lan Jinyai, and Shang Wen, greeted the Zheng. Lan Jinyai responded with a question. Where is my daughter, Lan Wu? The Zheng calmly replied, first, pay your respects to your parents. Then, we shall talk. Lan Jinyai started walking toward the gravesite. Just as Shang Wen was about to follow, the Zheng looked at him. Not you, Shang Wen. Outsiders aren't allowed in that sacred place. He is my son, Lan Wu, said Lan Jinyai without bothering to hide her anger. The Zheng shook his head, but, he still doesn't have any ties with the Lan sect. And neither had he any relations with the dead. He is an outsider in my view. You should be satisfied with the fact that I allowed your husband's mount and his son into this premises. Lan Wu also didn't hide his disgust as he looked at Shang Wen and the beast. He doesn't like the imperial family, for whom Lan Jinyai chose to betray the wishes of her father. You, Shang Wen clenched his fist but he controlled his emotions, knowing well that he is no match for the beast. Lan Jinyai told him to wait as she walked away. Once Lan Jinyai was out of sight, the Zheng then sat down in silence and closed his eyes. Shang Wen also kept his mouth shut for a while until he couldn't bear it anymore and said, I don't sense my sister anywhere on this mountain. I guess it must be behind the human who is helping you. The Zheng ignored his words and continued his nap. Shang Wen then spoke, on our way. I had a lot of time to think about your intentions behind this act. My mother is immortal. My sister is too young and my brother has already awakened the phoenix bloodline. He would probably become the emperor someday. So, I highly doubt you want to use them to revive your fallen sect. So, what is it that you are truly after? Lan Wu continued to play deaf as if he didn't hear him. But, Shang Wen didn't back down. He continued with his theory to confirm his suspicions. I had this friend of mine. You can say he is like a brother and I don't have any reason to distrust his words. He says that the gold dragon of the Wuji sect has aligned itself with Feng Wu. He also said that Feng Wu had contracted with this powerful demon, which was the one that attacked us and killed the Grand Secretariat. Now. You took this opportunity and abducted Shang Zhao. A powerful beast like you doesn't need to work with a human unless he or she is your contractor. And you don't accept just anyone as your partner too. He must be related to this sect and should also have a high cultivation realm. As Shang Wen was speaking out his own theory, something clicked in his head. The gold dragon left Lu Zhen's side after the birthday of Enter the Yang Zhen. And Yu Yang Zhen's prime minister is Lan Jing, my mother's paternal uncle. The Eastern Sun Kingdom has the largest reserves of gold and a long war will bring down our economic conditions, forcing my father to take a loan. Now, everything fits. Lan Jing is the one who is pulling the strings behind this entire situation. Isn't he? He has the perfect reason to take revenge. The Imperial Palace didn't send any help to Lan Sect during the dungeon break. In our defense, 
it is because we lack the strength to face it. But, in his view, we probably have betrayed him, and my mother's marriage to the emperor has probably escalated his anger. So, he waited for the opportunity to strike us down. The Zheng couldn't help but open his eyes and take another look at the second prince. This, it's not because he was surprised about the analysis of the second prince but it is because his master told him the same thing that the imperial palace will come to a conclusion. Mark intended to distract everyone's attention away from him by painting Lan Jing as the prime conspirator. Of course, by the time they investigated everything, they will figure out that Lan Jing has no role in this and they have been fooled all along by Mark. But, it will be too late by then. Mark would have already finished his revenge. Seeing the Zheng look at him in surprise, Shang Wen more felt like he was right. Making a serious expression, he said, No matter what you planned, I want to tell you that I will go to any extent to keep my family safe. If that involves selling my soul to a more powerful demon, I wouldn't hesitate to do so. Interesting, the Zheng finally responded to him, seeing that his master's plan is working. I can sense your sincerity when you said about protecting your family. Answer me, young warrior, what will do if your brothers turn against each other? Or if your mother or your sister turns against you? Shang Wen's face darkened, he didn't give an answer but instead asked him, what are you planning to do? Come back and ask me the same question when you were qualified to have a conversation with me. Weakling, replied the Zheng before he closed his eyes once again. Shang Wen's pride was hurt by the Zheng but he could only clench his fist and stay silent, not just because of the difference in their strength but it is also because of the fact that Lan Jinyi was still on the premises of the mountain and Shang Zhao's fate was at stake here. Meanwhile, at Imperial Palace, in the Emperor's chamber, Shang Fu was anxiously waiting for a message from his son. He was so concerned about the situation at Mount Lan that he refused all the requests for meeting from various sect heads and clan lords to discuss the situation about the war, as he was regretting not establishing a two-way communication talisman between him and his son. His thoughts were interrupted by his third son. Your Majesty, sorry for the disturbance but there is someone here to meet you, said the third prince while standing outside of the room. Shang Fu waved his hand, I'm not in the mood to talk right now, Shang Wei. I will meet the guest in the evening. Your Majesty, he is a supreme being, said the prince, gaining his attention immediately. A Walker of the Worlds, Chapter 1741 Anxious Counter Tilda wished Tilda, but while they were talking, several energy fluctuations could be felt coming from the front. Seems like they found us. Lin Mu said his expression turning serious. In the distance, the pair of man and woman were preparing something. The woman had six talismans floating in front of her in the shape of a pentagon, nine talismanic art cannon form. She chanted, several runes forming with her hand seals. The runes condensed into an orb in the center of the pentagon. The orb attached to the talisman in the center of the pentagon, as power started to condense in it. With me, senior brother. The third tribulation stage a mortal woman said before activating the talismanic formation. Fire. Tilda boom tilda. In the next moment, a loud explosion was heard as a mix of blue and white light shot out. The lights transformed into a large cannonball that now looked like a streaking meteor. Just a minute ago there was a red comet and now a blue and white meteor was flying in the sky. But that wasn't all as the fourth tribulation stage a mortal man also attacked. He pulled his glass sword back, before thrusting with it in a straight line, serene light thrust. An iridescent sword light flew out from the sword, accompanying the cannonball. The two intertwined and spun together, as if resonating with each other. The combined power of the two attacks was not small as could be seen from the expressions of the two immortals. Both the fourth tribulation stage immortal man and his junior sister looked to be exhausted. Their immortal chief fluctuations had also reduced by quite a lot showing that they had expended a lot of energy. This has to work. Unknown to others, the woman was quite anxious. The reason behind it was the disappearance of the sky saw wolf that she had frozen. The first thing that made her surprised was its sudden disappearance without her knowing it. Her senior brother hadn't sensed it either. The second thing that shocked her was the quick dispelling of her skill. That once someone is encased in the ice. Even senior brother would take a few minutes to break it, and yet, that person was able to dispel it in just a few seconds. This had also made her quite nervous, it made her think that the beast hadn't just disappeared on its own. Someone had actually taken it away, but if someone can do that, 
It meant they were just a few meters from us and we couldn't sense it at all. If they attacked at that time, we might have been wiped out. They are very strong. If they can do this. The woman had grasped. Having thought of all this, she decided to go all out and got her senior brother to join her as well. I don't know if we'll be able to survive for long, but getting this far might still be enough to satisfy the elders. The senior brother thought. They had their own goals for coming here and it was their luck that the two of them had ended up together in the spatial plane. Their serene glass valley has to reach at least the quarterfinals this time, if not us, hopefully, other members can do it. The senior brother thought to himself, the valley needs to have better results this time. At least the nobles should notice us again. Several powers and competitors had the same goal in the tournament to gain recognition and to improve their reputation. To some the rewards of the tournament didn't matter as much as the recognition of the others did. After all, the latter could bring them long-term benefits in the form of collaborations as well as various deals. Some powers used the tournament to display the various services they could provide by letting their members use those skills in the tournament. For example and power providing formations would let their members display various formations in the tournament, allowing the audience to notice it. The nobles who were looking for such services would certainly take a note and would contact them at a latter time. In fact this was a well-known thing, and the nobles specifically had people assigned to gathering this information. Someone even used the tournament as a way to pick prospective brides and grooms for their juniors. After all, what better person to marry than a ranker of the tournament? While the winners would most likely be out of reach, due to them being royalty like the third prince and Yao Qingying, the others were still a fair game. The best option for them would be the black horses who had rose to the top. They would be such wild cards that they could change the entire flow of the tournament. These contests would also be the most tempting to the nobles as they would often have no affiliation to other powers. It was the same as getting a strong expert without searching for them. Whatever their goals might be, Lin Mu and his companions didn't care to them. Only coming out on top mattered and their mission to defeat two individuals was important. And there was no way. Lin Mu was going to let it be spoiled. This is a lot more stronger than the previous attack, it's very fast too. Lin Mu sensed the incoming combo skill, it had barely been a second and it had already traveled half the distance. Lin Mu glanced at the Ming sisters and knew that they wouldn't be able to dodge this in time even if he could. He thought about pulling them along with him, but without little shrubby they might still get caught up in the attack. Lin Mu wasn't worried about getting defeated, but he couldn't say the same about the two. Ming Alien, Ming Dandan, behind me. Now, Lin Mu shouted. The Ming sisters had sensed the incoming attack as well and knew that it was too late to dodge it. They did as Lin Mu told and got behind him. Lin Mu meanwhile, brought his hands forward in a brace position. Dragon Monarch System. Chapter 392-392 Colon Beltharos The Devouring Shade Aditya, Aditya Alicia panicked seeing Aditya in such a horrible state. Aditya groaned in pain and then replied, I am not planning on dying this soon. At least not until, I give you a dragon baby. This isn't the time to joke. Normally Alicia would have blushed to hear such words, but this wasn't time for such nonsense. Open your mouth. She took out a glass tube that was filled with a green liquid. The green liquid was peak 5-star healing potion. Julia had given Alicia a few of them for emergency situations. Never thought she would find herself needing to use one of them. Gulp. As the potion reached down his throat, all of his injuries rapidly began to heal. Alicia then took a moment to look around. Everything within 25 meters radius was completely destroyed. She could sense many people were on the verge of death. One of them happens to be the Prime Minister of the Hefer Estus Kingdom. Adian gently put Fabian on the ground. He held his hand and gently asked, Fabian, talk to me. Fabian had used this body to protect Adian. Unlike Aditya, he wasn't that lucky. His body wasn't strong enough to withstand the explosion. Your Majesty, this is the end. I pray that one day, the Hefer Estus Kingdom regains its former glory and reaches a new height. Fabian's hand lost strength and was about to fall down when Adian grabbed his hand and tightly held it with tears running down his cheeks. Thank you for your years of service, my dear Prime Minister. Adian had great difficulty speaking these words. He never thought that his Prime Minister would leave him this way. Fabian had served Adian's father for a long time. After his father's death, 
Even when everything went wrong, Fabian was loyal to Adian and served him. Pushing the debris, Daxton stood up and removed the jacket that he was wearing. Daxton being a fifth order cultivator was able to survive the explosion even though he was slightly injured. He also managed to protect his Prime Minister. Adam also managed to survive. Are you alright, your majesty? Adam asked. Daxton rolled his eyes and replied. Before asking, you should look at yourself. Adam sadly smiled before looking to his right. It appears Duke Elliot Campbell wasn't that lucky. Duke Campbell instantly died from the explosion. Never thought that this old man would go out this way. Even though the Onard House and the Campbell were bitter rivals for generations, Adam never really hated Duke Elliot. Duke Elliot was from Adam's father's generation. He greatly respected the old man. It's a shame that he died early, as his son is still immature and not ready to handle the duties of his father. Adam's body began healing after he ate a five-star healing pill that his daughter made for him. Daxton's injuries weren't that serious. With his natural healing abilities, those burns will heal in no time. Scene change underscore. Jonathan, are you still alive? Lying under the debris of the wooden house, the Emperor of Queenstown called his friend. Although Arik had hidden many things from Jonathan, he still considered Jonathan a good friend. Pushing away the wooden dune, Jonathan showed his pained face. His forehead was covered in blood. The rest of his body had suffered second-degree burns. Yeah, Arik was lying injured on the ground. He saw his friend Jonathan was still alive. Feeling relieved, Arik got up to help Jonathan. What the hell was that? Lucas should have warned us about whatever he was planning on doing in this meeting. Arik complained about Lucas while helping Jonathan sit up not knowing that the devil was behind them and was listening to their conversation. I don't want to be part of this shitty alliance anymore. Jonathan complained. If Jonathan wasn't a part of this alliance, he wouldn't have been forced into this war and wouldn't have lost millions of his soldiers, and he wouldn't have been this miserable. Yeah, after all this is over, I'm leaving this alliance. The only party benefiting from this alliance is Lucas and his empire. Are you sure about that? A hideous voice reached both Eric and Jonathan's ears. Both of their backs stiffened. Both emperors started trembling, when they slowly turned their heads. They saw a monster in front of their eyes. This monster didn't have any resemblance to Lucas. Who are you? The monster in front of them was three meters tall. It had dark skin, large black bat wings, black eyes, and two sharp horns on its head. The most notable feature of its body was the dark purple-colored diamond-shaped crystal at its chest. The diamond-shaped crystal was in the middle of his chest. The crystal was embedded into his ribcage. Dark purple veins were spread from the crystal. Each second, the crystal was pulsing, as if it was alive. The monster in front of them looked very ugly to them. It was like a creature that had walked out of hell. Neither Arik nor Jonathan had ever seen anything uglier than this creature. Even the ugliest being in this world would look pretty in front of this monster. The monster had a sinister aura. Being stared at by this monster, made both of them feel extremely nervous, as if this creature from hell had come here to take them to hell. Who am I? That's a stupid question. Just a few seconds ago, you two were talking about betraying me. It was then that both Eric and Jonathan realized that this monster was none other than Lucas, as for how the Echo Nexus Emperor turned into this hideous looking monster, they had no idea about it. You're Lucas. The monster's giant palms grabbed their faces. Lucas, please don't kill us. For decades, we have been loyal to you and only you. We stood by your side and have helped you. We have served and we will have service to the Alliance leader. Lucas moment really stopped before looking at Eric and Jonathan's faces. Unfortunately, it's too late for that. Ah, Eric and Jonathan's bodies started to wither. Both of them struggled with all of their rights to free themselves but failed to do anything. Lucas raised their bodies up in the air. Wrinkles started appearing on their bodies. It was as if both of their bodies were rapidly aging. A second later, both of their bodies stopped moving. TSK. I barely received anything. What a waste these two were. Lucas threw away the two dead bodies like garbage. Eric and Jonathan's bodies had turned withered corpses. Both looked like thousand years old mummies. It was as if someone had extracted every single drop of blood and water from their bodies. Time to hunt for some more meals. Lucas then disappeared. Scene change underscore. How are you doing? Are you alright? Are you still in pain? Aditya just nodded his head. Thanks to Alicia's quick actions, his injuries had 40% healed. Within a few more minutes. His body should be completely healed. Seeing Aditya trying to stand up, Alicia healed him. After standing up, 
Both of them took a moment to look at the destruction around them. Just a few hours ago, this peaceful village was covered in snow and beautiful houses were around them, but now anything within 25 meters range has been destroyed due to the explosion. With his enhanced senses, he could feel that many people had died in this explosion. If he hadn't acted even a second later, then Alicia also would have died, and that very thought of her dying scared him very much. Aditya, yeah, I can also feel its presence. There is no way I won't be able to feel his hideous and sinister aura. Both of them were talking about the monster responsible for this destruction. How did Lucas suddenly turn into that monster? Aditya wondered out loud. Alicia heard Aditya's question, but before she could say anything, her eyes suddenly became dazed and lost focus. It was almost as if she was lost in her thoughts. Let us escape this prison. I can't wait to return to Earth and conquer the seven continents once again. Alicia suddenly found herself having a vision. In her vision, she saw millions of black humanoid-looking monsters with large bat wings and horns on top of their heads, in a place where lava was flowing in place of a river, and where the sky was red. It was a different world. No ordinary human would be able to survive in such a place. All of these monsters were locked in cages. Amidst all the screaming and shouting, suddenly a wave of golden flame came from the sky. It's over for us. We are finished. All the monsters screamed. The flame then consumed every single one of the monsters, and just like that millions of monsters were killed. What the hell was that? The vision lasted for a few seconds. Even though it was a vision, she still remembered many details. That flame looked similar to the hell fire that the members of my family are capable of using. Alicia was a fire mage herself. She had been using the hell flame with her spells. Because of the hell flame, any fire type skills that she uses don't consume too much of her mana. But it was much more powerful. Alicia, I am going to face this monster. Alicia snapped out of her dazed. Alicia looked concerned. She knew even if she wanted to stop him, he wouldn't listen. And truthfully, only he was strong enough to stop this monster. Take everyone with you and leave this island. This island isn't safe anymore. Once the fight started, the collision of their attacks might even take out the entire island. While fighting this monster, Aditya can't guarantee the safety of his wife and his people. All right, take care of yourself. Aditya nodded before vanishing out of Alicia's sight. With each step, one by one, he started activating his passive skills. He also wore the Crimson Warlock armor set. Inferno Overdrive Storm Flight Lightning Armor Crimson Lightning Dash Scene Change Underscore Goo When Aditya arrived, he saw a 3 meters tall monster had lifted a beginner fifth order cultivator by his throat. Under his eyes, the cultivator's body began to wither rapidly. Within a few seconds, the cultivator's corpse withered like a thousand years of mummy. You're finally here. I have been waiting for you. The monster casually threw away the dead body of the cultivator and then turned around. Around the monsters, there were 100 other dead withered corpses. He had killed every single people that came with him to this island. Who are you? No, the question should be what are you? Are you Lucas or a monster? Aditya's main objective was to buy time so that Alicia can take everyone and leave this island. Aditya would be able to fight without having to worry about others. That's an interesting question. Even I'm not sure about the answer. I am still Lucas, but I am also Beltharos the Devouring Shade. Beltharos the Devouring Shade. Aditya started to walk around Lucas. What exactly you have turned yourself into? Aditya couldn't help but ask. He didn't have any knowledge about the monster that Lucas had turned himself into. I have lived for more than seven centuries. It had taken me seven centuries to build the current Echo Nexus Empire. You might be more powerful than me, but I am more knowledgeable than you. Aditya secretly rolled his eyes. He wanted a straight answer. In my long life, I was fortunate enough to find the corpses of some beings that do not originate from this realm. It took a long time but I finally succeeded. Through numbers trails and errors, I have become, to be continued. Evolution, start as a raft. Chapter 229 by I am Link 229. Guardian type mutation. If even Trajan was not a match for the Ice Emperor, then this sea god fruit was of great significance to Rain. What kind of sea god fruit do you have? Rain asked. I want to see it first. We didn't bring it with us. If Governor Rain wants to see it, we will bring it to the designated location in the deep sea. Good. Without delay, Rain immediately left the governor's mansion with his men and the Naga. After waiting for two days at the designated location, 
the radar showed that the naga had arrived. This was a blue sea god fruit, but unlike the usual green sea god fruit, it was surrounded by a faint blue light. Rain could already tell that this sea god fruit was extraordinary. This sea god fruit seemed to be in a different league compared to other rare sea god fruits. You give me the sea god fruit just like this? Aren't you afraid that I won't keep my promise? Rain asked. Governor Rain, we have been observing you since you entered the King's Sea, and we have done our research before deciding to trade with you, Salada said. There is nothing in this world that is 100% certain. We can only take a gamble now. I do intend to deal with the Ice Emperor, and I am not hiding that fact, but I am not sure if I can save your people. If you kill the Ice Emperor, his blockade will naturally be lifted. As for whether our people are still alive, that will be up to fate. Good, then there is no doubt. Rain extended his hand. Deal. Salada and Rain shook hands. Deal. The appearance of the Naga clan seemed to open a new door for Rain. The closer he got to the Corsi, the more unfamiliar this world became. If the Naga clan existed in this world, then would there be other races as well? What kind of opponents would he face in the future? The words of the archaeologist still echoed in Rain's ears. However, Rain was not afraid. Instead, he felt excited about exploring the unknown world. It's better not to let me encounter any mythical level things. I'll kick their ass if they happen to encounter me, Rain boasted. Anyway, let's take a look at the sea god fruit first. Whether we can defeat the ice emperor or not depends on you. Rain first put the sea god fruit into the strengthening room, but to everyone's surprise, this so-called legendary sea god fruit could not be strengthened. What the hell? Isn't it the longer it holds on, the stronger it gets? Rain shook his head. Since the Fire Heaven Crystal could not strengthen it, Rain could only prepare to swallow it directly. Fancy, only beer, and two bears stood beside Rain, looking nervous. Captain, the Naga won't poison you, will they? Rain was taken aback for a moment. He thought about it, and the system had already confirmed that it was a sea god fruit and did not indicate any danger. So it should be fine. They won't, Rain said confidently and then peeled off the outer skin of the sea god fruit and ate it in one bite. After five minutes, ten minutes, and thirty minutes, Rain felt that his body was undergoing some kind of rapid change. After forty-five minutes, Rain had completed the fusion. He immediately summoned the system, Rain, Captain, the body of the son of Poseidon, stage five level one, one-tenth, basic attributes one hundred and fifty-six times that of an ordinary person physical combat power 312, each level in this stage increases by 32 points. Skills, Tiger's Fang, 10 tenths, within 10 seconds, speed increases by 200%, strength increases by 200%, sensing increases by 100%, and reaction speed increases by 50%. Cooldown time, 30 minutes, mutation count, 4. Detailed classification 1. Combat type biological mutation, mutation ability, 3 dragon transformation, first transformation, level 31, attributes increase by 310% in water and decrease by 14% on land, second transformation, level 31, a layer of dragon scales can be formed on the surface of the body, which can increase underwater movement speed by 200%. Already at the limit, an increased defense by 155 points. Third transformation, level 31, obtain dragon skin and dragon bones, increase physical defense and hardness, increase unarmed attack power by 155 points, and increase defense by 155 points. Detailed classification 2, support type mutation, Naga's gaze, primary, 2030, can be breakthrough skill information. Under the current level, gaze at the enemy unit for one second, causing their entire body to stiffen for two seconds. Detailed classification 3, material type mutation, flame transformation, 1120, the body can be transformed into a flame form. The basic attributes had become more and more abnormal. All the previous skill limits had been broken through, except for Naga's gaze which requires additional practice to increase its level, all other skills are synchronized with Rain's level. Of course, the most important thing was the change after the fourth mutation. Detailed classification for Guardian type mutation. Guardian spirit, Naga god, modern mermaid god. What is a guardian type mutation? A new species? 
Rain wondered, Mermaid God is Mermaid God, why add modern, wouldn't the more ancient the God, the more powerful it is? Divine Guardian, cannot be upgraded, the user gains the Naga clan's divine spirit, the modern Mermaid God, and can use the Dragon Slayer Strike once within three months. Dragon Slayer Strike. Attack power is 1000 times the user's basic attributes. Not affected by the environment, not affected by transformation, not affected by current combat power, and not affected by other skills of both sides. When used with a weapon, it can produce a sword energy attack. With just one sentence, Rain was stunned. As a result, this sea god fruit did not transform or enhance his attributes, but only gave him a skill, and a skill that cannot be upgraded. However, this skill was a bit too strong. What did attack power is 1000 times the user's basic attributes mean? If it was an ordinary stage 5 level 10 mutant, their basic attributes could reach 100 points. When multiplied by 1000, the attack power of Dragon Slayer Strike could reach 100,000 points. The attacking power of one Hurricane anti ship missile was 10,000 points. The force of this blow was equivalent to 10 Hurricane anti ship missiles. Even the super battleship itself cannot withstand 10 Hurricane anti ship missiles. If Rain's level was maxed out without using any skills, his basic attribute could reach 600 points. If he uses the Dragon Slayer Strike, the attack power could reach 600,000 points. Rain swallowed his saliva. Even if he could only use it once every three months, it didn't matter. One attack of 600,000 points was already enough. Holy God. I just want to upgrade my fleet well. Why did you make me so strong? Rain was in a state of confusion. If he used this skill, it would truly be another cheating like existence. Adventure of Nana Chapter 01 by Azla. Chapter 01 Start of Adventure. It was the night of my first day at school. I had been up late last night, so it felt like midday to me. I think that's why the sun was shining so brightly in my bedroom. Morning, Tuya. Tuya Senpai was standing by my bedside when I woke up. He gave me a gentle smile and said, Good morning, Nana. Nana-san is my maid. She came with us on our journey from the capital city to this place. Right now, she was dressed in her normal maid uniform. We had found an inn after we reached the village last night, but since it wasn't far off the highway, we made camp near the roadside instead. Since we were traveling light, we didn't have any luggage for her to carry, so she ended up sleeping outside under the stars. As soon as I saw her this morning, my heart skipped a beat. Her short hair and cute face are just too adorable. And her body, it's such a shame that she has no chest because those long legs would look fantastic wrapped around me. If only I could. My mind wandered into dangerous territory and I started to panic. My breathing grew ragged as I stood there completely frozen. Thankfully, Tama noticed my distress and tried to calm me down. Hey, Tuya. Wakey wakey. The moment he spoke, Tuya Senpai's eyes shot open. Huh? What happened? He looked at Tama and then back at me before his cheeks turned red. Sorry about that, Tuya. Nana thought you might be having some problems getting up, so she came to help. Oh, I had totally forgotten that I was still naked. That's how embarrassed I am right now. Tuya Senpai cleared his throat and made a fake cough sound. Ahem, you're probably not used to wearing clothes yet, but you should wear them anyway when you go out. Especially if it's cold outside. He must have seen me shivering in the cold air, because he just added fuel to the fire. I glared at him while my face got hotter and hotter. Ahaha, sorry, but do take care of your own hygiene, okay? Hygiene? No matter how hard I tried, my voice couldn't hide the embarrassment I was feeling. Um, you know, washing yourself, brushing your teeth, stuff like that, he explained. I wanted to ask what kind of person doesn't brush their teeth, but I decided to play along instead. Okay, I'll remember that. Thank you very much. I bowed my head to thank him. Tuya Senpai smiled awkwardly and began to stand up. Don't mention it, just promise me one thing. What is it? When you get home, don't forget to tell your parents about this. He flashed me another awkward smile before disappearing through the doorway. I watched him go for a few moments before I heard the door close behind him. Then, I let out a sigh. Maybe I'm overreacting. I mean, I did come here without telling anyone and ran away from home, so I can't really complain. But the fact that he even mentioned that I need to keep this a secret made me feel guilty all the same. I tried to shake it off as best I could, but thinking about it made me feel depressed. 
I sat up slowly and pulled on the clothes I'd left lying next to the bed earlier. Next, I went to the bathroom attached to the room and took a quick shower to wash myself clean. The warm water felt great, and I enjoyed the sensation of the soap running down my skin. Afterward, I ate breakfast. Since we had a little time to spare, I decided to eat something other than bread. After all, I didn't want to run out of energy halfway through the day. I picked out some vegetables and fruits from the basket we'd brought along. I placed the food back in the basket and set it aside. Next, I grabbed the book I was reading yesterday and opened it again. It was a collection of fairy tales that I'd borrowed from the library in the capital. I read until the sun rose high in the sky. Once it was noon, Tuya Senpai returned. He was carrying a large bag over his shoulder. What's that? Oh, that's where I put your luggage. He pointed at the bag I was referring to and puffed out his chest proudly. I just rolled my eyes. Thanks, Senpai. I hurriedly took the bag from him. If you're done eating, we should leave. Yes, sir. I followed him out of the house and onto the road. So what exactly is the plan for today, Senpai? Well, the first thing is to find a job. A job. I tilted my head curiously. You see, the only way for us to live here is to work. We can't rely on the money from selling our weapons or equipment, so we need to find a proper job. That's why I brought these papers and this map. Senpai handed me two items, each of which was folded into a square. These are maps of the area, there's also a list of the available jobs, they're written in the local language, so I'll translate it for you, okay? Okay. I took the documents from him and unfolded them, here we go. There's a lot to choose from, you see that one there? My eyes fell upon a paper with a picture of a horse on it. I nodded and kept reading. That's the name of a place called Horse Farm. I guess they raise horses for the military or whatever. Doesn't that require skills or experience? I asked him as I continued flipping through the pages. Not necessarily. As long as you're willing to work, you should be fine. Anyway, let's go pick a job together. Sounds good to me. He smiled and slapped my back. The horse farm was located in an area of the village that was surrounded by fields. This is it. Senpai stopped in front of a small building. It was just a wooden shack with a roof made of straw, but it seemed like the kind of place where you could learn new things. Hello, I'm looking for a job. Senpai entered the building and I followed him in. Inside, there were two men who looked to be around the same age as us. One of them wore a green hat and the other was wearing a dark blue one. Judging by their appearance, they were probably the owners of the farm. Both of them immediately jumped to their feet. Welcome, welcome, welcome. They both greeted us at once. Who might you be? My name is Tuyu and this is Nana. Senpai introduced us to the two. And what brings you here today? One of them asked in a gruff voice as he scratched his head. His face looked familiar, but I couldn't quite place it. Why? We're looking for a job. Of course. Do you have any openings? The man narrowed his eyes and squinted at us suspiciously. HMHM, what sort of work are you looking for? Anything that pays well. Is there anything suitable for someone who knows how to use magic? Senpai answered the question with a confident smile. Well, yes, our stable boy quit recently, so I suppose there's an opening. But, how much does it pay? Nothing, unfortunately. His answer disappointed me. I guess this isn't the kind of place where you can get rich quickly, but we're desperate so we'll do anything you ask of us. Well, it seems like I have no choice but to hire you then. Let's talk business later. Thank you very much. I bowed my head to express my gratitude. The man motioned for us to follow him. So we headed toward the back of the building. Right this way, we entered a small room filled with straw mats and tables. On one side was a big pot full of water, on the other was an assortment of tools. A young girl was sitting in front of the table in the middle of the room. She was about my age, with long black hair tied in a ponytail. She was wearing a white dress that looked more like apron than clothing. Um, excuse me. Oh, it's you again. She stared at us blankly for a second before she finally realized who we were. Wah, you. Her mouth opened wide as she stared at me. I timidly turned around. Senpai was standing next to me. He was staring at the girl as well, but I couldn't tell if he was impressed or concerned. N. No, wait, you're Nana, aren't you? I remember you, you're the maid that came with Tuya Senpai. Her eyes widened even further and tears appeared in her eyes. Why you remember? Oh, that makes me happy. I haven't been able to see him for so long. I see. So that's why you're crying. I'm. 
I'm not crying, it's okay, I don't mind if you cry, I smiled at her warmly and nodded, then, I turned back around, I'm sorry for bringing you to a place like this, Nana, A Knight's Journey, The Knight's Multiverse, Chapter 01 by Calm Wanderer, Chapter 1, Choices Have Consequences Part 1, Harlem, New York City, USA, Damien's POV, as the cacophony of the city that never sleeps resounded in the ears of the people exiting the subway's entrance, a young man, who looked just as tired and apathetic as everyone else around him suddenly checked his watch. 10p.m. Ah, he muttered with a sigh, his body moving automatically in the direction of his apartment. I wonder if it will ever end. The compulsory overtime disguised as a bullshit think about it as a boost for your career Damien. Everyone has it hard miss tonight, so suck it up. I should just quit, but then, what am I supposed to do after? Pondering over a potential life-changing decision that he kept postponing day after day, it took him a few seconds to notice his phone's ringing tone replacing the music he was listening to earlier through his earphones. Shaking his head slightly to disperse his chaotic thoughts, he decided to ignore the call, not having the energy to talk to anyone. They'll leave a message if it's important. He tried to convince himself, as if he could not guess who it was. After all, who in 2023 still used their phone to call people? At least he did not, most of the time. Unfortunately, or fortunately, he was not really sure. He knew that it was just the beginning, trying to call him just once, that was as impossible as the sun rising in the west. And his expectations were met when the ringtones reverberated in his ears again as if to make fun of his earlier thoughts. Sighing for what felt the hundred times today, Damien gave up trying to avoid her call. He knew that she would be relentless since she started to notice a while ago that his life was not going as well as he told her. Looking at his phone where the word mom was written in capital letter, he muttered, partially amused and partially afraid, how does she know every time I feel down? At that point, it's not an instinct, it's a superpower. I'm stalling, aren't I? As his mother called him a third time, he took a deep breath to calm his nerves and willed his thumb to tap on the green icon. Hi mum, sorry if I didn't answer right away, but I was busy. He said, doing his best to appear as happy as possible. Hi sweetie, don't worry about it. I called you because I had a surprise visit tonight, and since I knew you've been working overtime these days, I thought I could get you on the phone to talk a little. His mother said with her sweet voice, which never fails to calm him down. Her constant love and support never failed to help him get through the tough situations that initially seemed insurmountable. Wait, so is the someone who visited still here? He asked, trying to guess who could have come to see his mother at 10 p.m. on a Thursday. The male voice that he heard through the phone right after put an end to his pondering though. Hello, there. A classic. Damien thought, his mood already starting to get better. Is that you General Kenobi? He asked in return trying to imitate Grievous voice. It is I, my young Padawan. And this time I have the high ground. The man continued, barely holding his laughter. Moom, tell those two dorks to stop. My brain can't deal with my two adorably stupid brothers. Another female voice came up from the phone, stopping Damien and his brother from their Star Wars quoting adventure. Feeling puzzled and amused at the same time, Damien asked her. Jane. Is it supposed to be a compliment or an insult? As soon as he asked, he could hear her laughing a bit and then said, faking seriousness. That's my secret, it's both. Her antics made all of them snort in laughter, until their mother lightly reprimanded the other two. All right, Jane, and Michael, I'm trying to speak to your brother, so stop messing around, you'll have ample time to do that this weekend. By the way, Damien, you didn't forget about this weekend. Did you? Damien knew that she was talking about her invitation to spend the weekend at her beach house in Florida. Despite its reputation as a state full of crazies, the young man enjoyed each and every occasion he had to visit his mother there. And the fact that he lacked motivation this time, was for the same reason that he was reluctant to answer her call, to avoid the conversation he knew they would have about his life choices, which stressed him out. Of course I didn't mum. I'm just feeling a bit tired these days, so I'm not sure if I'll come or not. Hearing his vain attempts at escaping, his mother took a serious and almost authoritative tone. Damien Knight. I know exactly what you're trying to do, and I, as your mother, will not let you do it. You're coming home this weekend, and it's final. 
if I have to come get you myself, believe me, I will. She paused slightly before continuing in a warm tone, trying to convey her love and care to him. Sweetie, I can tell that you have some troubles you're not telling me. Even if I have my guesses about what it's about, if you're not talking to anyone about it, it will keep hurting you. So it's best that we take this weekend to work out what's bothering you. Plus, your brother and sister are staying here till Sunday night, so we'll all be together. Even Jane told me that she missed you a lot. Mum, I said I missed my stupid brother. You need to be accurate with your words or he might misunderstand. This girl. The three's mother said with a fake desperate tone which made Michael and Damien snicker and the later reply, Remember mum, it's an insult and a compliment, otherwise it doesn't work. As the four quipped back and forth, Damien's mood improved a lot and he finally decided to share with them the cause of his dilemma, finally overcoming his earlier reluctance. Hey guys, I need to share some things I guess. If you don't mind listening for a bit. That silenced everyone but his mother who replied, encouragingly. Go ahead, honey, we're listening. Taking a deep breath to settle his nerves, he continued. I, well, let's just say that I'm feeling a bit, no scratch that. Completely lost, I just don't know what to do, where I'm going, if I'm supposed to go somewhere. Huh? Realizing that he was rambling incoherently he paused. All right Damien. Remember what I taught you. Focus on your breathing. In. And out. In. And out. She advised, noticing his breathing becoming chaotic. He listened to his mother's instructions and started to get his breathing under his control. He also felt his heart calming down as well. Feeling more serene, he reassured the other three. All right, I. Think I'm better. Great. His mother replied, now, you can tell us what's wrong, do it one thing at a time, not wanting to be overwhelmed by by what felt like an insurmountable amount of problems, he started with what seemed like the most obvious one, his job, see, it's about my job, don't get me wrong, uck, it is well paid, I guess it also gives me a certain status, and that's what I was looking for, at least, at first, but now? It feels like it's sucking everything that gives life meaning from my soul. I, I work so many hours that my whole life seems to revolve around my job. I, I don't have any fucking time to do anything else, to do things I enjoy. Even the physical exercises that I used to love to do became something I'm only doing out of desperation. To hold on to at least something that makes me want to keep living. He paused slightly to control his out of control emotions before resuming with a question. You know the craziest thing? I've spent many hours pondering over that and trying to understand, but I couldn't find any answer. I'm working a job I hate, to make money I can use to pay for rent and others essential things so that I can stay here to, in the end, not lose my job. It's a fucking unending vicious cycle. He finished in a low, almost desperate, tone, trying to make him feel better. Michael interrupted. Bro, aren't you in one of the most interesting city in the world? I'm sure there are many interesting things around you can do, aren't there? Chuckling wryly, Damien answered. You would be right, except, sigh I don't have any freaking time. Those fucking morons in the higher management think that we are their slave and as long as they promise us some money, they can do whatever the fuck they want. Fuck. When I see their condescending face looking at me, I just want to punch their ugly mug extremely violently. His sister then remarked. You know you could always say no, right? Jane it's not that easy. If I say no once, then they'll probably mark me down as someone that can't take the pressure and that will be a blow for my career. They might even push me to resign if I do it too many times. And then what am I supposed to do? No job and no money. In this world, it's game over. Damien? Jane asked innocently. Feeling a bit tired from the conversation, he retorted. What? You know, you're so stupid that you don't even recognize how stupid you are? Despite anticipating a sarcastic remark, the young man could not help himself from feeling his anger rise at what he perceived was a non-acknowledgement of what he was going through. As he was about to make a venomous remark, his mother intervened to defuse the situation by saying, All right you two calm down, and you Jane, I told you a thousand times to be more delicate when you say something to others, the way you said what you said was hurtful, now. Apologize to your brother and explain with human words what you wanted to tell him. Feeling a bit reluctant, she muttered almost inaudibly. Fine. Sorry. 
Despite her apology not being all too genuine, it made Damien's displeasure simmer down. Whatever. His mother then said, Go ahead, sweetie. Explain to him why you said that he was slow in the head. Her mischievous tone at the end made all three of them chuckle and the awkward atmosphere evaporate. Ugh, fine, mum. What I meant, my stupid brother, was this. What's the real reason why you can't say no? Because everything you said sounded like excuses to me. You don't even like your job. Quit it and find something you like doing. You're just doing the same as dad. And you know exactly what kind of person he is. You make it sound like something complicated, but in the end, you're the one that make it so. Despite wanting to refute her, he knew she was right. So he just retorted, I know you're right but I, I don't know. To this, Michael cut him off. Look bro, I get that you're scared and you want to live up to what you think other expect of you. But like Jane said, it's exactly what dad did and in the end, none of us can be in the same room as him without wanting to punch him in the face. I've been through what you're going through now, and I can tell you one thing, the sooner you start doing things that make you really happy, and not what others expect you to do, the sooner you'll truly live your life as you're meant to be, listening to their caring words, doing their best to help him, caused a smile to appear on his face. Aren't I supposed to be the oldest sibling in the family? Not when you're acting like a retard. The youngest countered Jane. Language. Their mother yelled at her amidst the other two laughter. Michael jokingly saying Captain America is back. To which Damien replied I understood that reference. After which, he cut off Jane's fierce explanation about how it was unjust that their mother only blamed her and not Damien when he used curse words earlier. Guys, all of you are right. You know what? I'll do it. If you don't mind, we'll brainstorm together to help me find something I like to do and that I can monetize. I'll also write my letter of resignation with all of you. I. That'll help me feel less scared I think. Hallelujah my people. My retarded brother's brain seemed to have finally been switched on. To which, Michael seemingly not wanting to be left out yelled in a fake amazed tone. IT's alive. After which they howled with laughter. Mum, are you really sure that they're not adopted? Unfortunately, they're not. His mother answered with a mock helpless tone, which stole a chuckle from him. Anyway, sweetie. You told me about that beautiful neighbor of yours a few days ago, the one you're attracted to, did you ask her out yet? Damien has a girlfriend, ignoring the two brats, he answered in an embarrassed tone. No, not yet, I'm not really sure about it, I mean you know, she already has a daughter, and I'm not sure I'm good enough to, I mean it's a lot of responsibility. The volume of his voice kept lowering until it ended in an almost inaudible whisper. X. C U S E S X C U S E S X C U S E S He could hear his sister's voice blasting in his ears almost as if she was making a rain dance, with his brother quickly joining after, as she was used to their shenanigans, her mother did not acknowledge what they were doing in the background. Let's not talk about the child, I'm asking about the mother, do you like her? Following her wise move. He replied, liking her may be a bit much, since we haven't even been on a date yet, but I can't deny that she's very attractive to me. Then you should just ask her out. You're not even in a relationship with her and you're already stressing out about being a father. Go step by step. If it works, then it's great. If it doesn't, then it would still be an experience you can learn from. Do. IT. Do. IT. Do. IT. Also, there is a saying that goes something like this. Being a parent is the only job that you'll never be ready for whether before or while you are one. All parents just improvise and adapt the way they raise their kids along what they experience. She finished, taking a minute to ponder in, almost complete silence if one did not pay attention to the two yelling monkeys in the background trying to imitate Shia Labouf, about what she just told him and what he should do about Sophia. His neighbor scratching his short beard in contemplation, he shook his head chuckling. I guess, if I'm to make big change with my life, I might as well do it till the end, right? You're right, dear. Yep. Exactly. As he made those life-changing decisions, Damien suddenly felt a lot lighter, as if the figurative mountain that was crushing him disappeared from his body while taking all the pain and misery with it. Most of it, at least. He even felt his former tiredness vanish and what felt like his long-lost life flame, as his mother put it, rekindled, I slash n, 
just a way to say that he rekindled his will and pleasure to live. I'll ask her out then. Yeah. But not today. Boo. Because it's 10 p.m. and I don't want to bother her, so I'll ask her tomorrow. You happy now? You two gremlins? Yeah. But I'm not a gremlin stupid brother. I'm a beautiful princess who is waiting for her perfect prince charming. Damien retorted, chuckling. Good luck with that. You'll probably need it. What? How dare you? Mikhail then quipped back. All right Greta Thunberg, calm down. Anyway, bro, good luck with our future sister-in-law. Also, mom will probably stop telling us to have kids so that she can spoil them. Nice. Mikhail sweetie, I'll never stop bothering the two of you with that. So you should lose that hope of yours. No. He answered in an overly dramatic voice. Damien's mother then said, but dear, he is somewhat right, you know. I'd be very happy if you brought your future lady friend with her daughter to see me. She'd be my first granddaughter. She finished with a few giggles, probably already thinking about everything she would buy her, what kind of game they would play together, or even what kind of dish she should make her. A completely lost cause Damien thought amusingly. Looking around, he noticed that he was almost at his apartment. So he said to the other three, guys, I'm almost there, so I'm gonna hang up. Before that, thank you, all of you, for being there for me, even if I can be stubborn, I guess, or stupid as Jane put it. I said chuckling slightly, anyway, thank you for being who you are, I'm really lucky to have all of you, love you all very much. Love you too sweetie. Love you stupid brother who's becoming smarter. Love you brother from the same mother. I added, see you guys this weekend. See you later. See you. See you this weekend, dear. After they all finished saying goodbye, Damien tapped his screen to hang up the call and put his phone back into his front pocket, while he kept walking towards the old building a few dozens of meters away. Chapter 2, Choices Have Consequences Part 2 Damien's POV, before even reaching the entrance door, he noticed that something seemed wrong. While frowning he started to observe the door to find what he expected to be the cause. Perfect. Someone broke the lock again. What a shitty neighborhood. He thought irritated. Mom was right. I really need to leave this place. Whatever, I won't be staying here for long anyway. I'll just have to put up with it till then. He concluded, shaking his head to stop himself from dwelling on those negative thoughts. Instead, he resumed walking towards the stairs as the elevator had been out of service for a week now. Despite many tenants calling the property agent to fix it, so far nothing has been done. A shitty building and a property agent who did not give a shit about the tenants. A perfect combo. As the prospect of leaving the place started to look better and better in his mind, he finally arrived on the third floor where he could see the door to his apartment at the end of the corridor. Despite his earlier thoughts, he was still glad to finally arrive home. He felt exhausted and a nice cold beer with the rest of pizza from last night sounded heavenly right about now. Picking up the pace, his gaze was suddenly attracted to the door leading to the interior of the beautiful neighbor's apartment that his mother talked to him about earlier. Indeed, her door was partially open, which never happened usually. That was because, as he said earlier, the neighborhood was not very safe at night, especially for a beautiful woman and her young daughter. Especially since some people like to break the building's entrance door's lock. Intrigued and slightly worried, Damien put his hand on the doorknob and while opening the door noticed something that made him feel even more uneasy. The door frame looks broken, as if someone kicked. Oh fuck. Fearing what could have happened to Sophia and her lovely daughter, Damien opened the door the whole way and quickly entered the apartment. Fortunately. He found them almost immediately in the living room. Unfortunately, far from being reassured, the situation unfolding before his eyes made his heart and breathing erratic from panic, not for himself, since his adrenaline shot up as well, lowering his human instincts while increasing his animal ones, but for the woman he unconsciously considered as a potential lover and the little girl he also unconsciously considered as a potential daughter. Why did he feel that way? Simply because in between the girls and him was a man who looked like he had been living on the street for years. Adding to that, his seemingly demented mutterings and his right hand holding a handgun. It's a moving towards the girls and the ceiling alternatively, and one could understand what Damien was feeling right then. Understanding that time was of the essence if he wanted to prevent the worst, he started to run towards the madman as fast as he could. Regrettably for him, 
Luck did not seem to be on his side as the man heard noise and started to turn around his gun moving in the same direction as his body, which was towards Damien. As the latter's brain registered what was going on, time seemed to slow down, and he understood that this may be his last day on earth. However, before his fear took hold of his mind, he remembered what his mother always told him. Choices have consequences. So, you should not leave any regret behind, sweetie. No regret, ah. Uh. The corner of his lips rising slightly because of that thought, the creeping terror dissipating into nothingness, as if time waited for him to make peace with the situation. His perception returned to normal right after the change. Sophia's POV. The situation then unfurled so quickly that Sophia and her daughter's mind did not have time to register what was happening beside the three gunshots. In less than a dozen seconds, the madman was on the floor, bleeding out from his upper chest area, with two gunshot wounds close to each other. Despite not being proficient in biology, Sophia felt confident that the man would not make it, not that she wanted him to anyway. No, what she was worried about was her neighbor for which she had a small crush on, and who just saved both her life and her daughter, she could see him smiling at her, seemingly proud of what he had just done, it wasn't as bad as I thought, he said, before flinching in pain, finally noticing the wound on his stomach that was bleeding quickly, fuck, he cursed before losing strength in his legs and falling on her sofa, back first, Damien's POV, looking at the soon to be dead man on the floor, he could feel adrenaline pumping in his veins and thus could not feel any disgust at what happened and thus decided to ignore it. Turning his head on the side, he could not help but smile at mature woman. Proud of having saved her and her adorable daughter, it wasn't as bad as I thought. He told her, before a wave of pain and weakness invaded his body with its source being his stomach, where he could see his own blood flowing out, seemingly without end. Fuck. He cursed before falling on the sofa, back first. Not wasting any time, Sophia used a shirt she had lying around to quench the blood before calling for an ambulance, all the while crying silently. She's a tough woman. Damien thought, feeling his consciousness blurring more and more. Too bad for me. You know, I wanted to a, cough, ask you out, b but, I was. Cough, too scared b, before. He told her in a slight delirious state. Sob, you're stupid. He could hear her voice breaking from sadness. I would ha, sob, have said yes. Her words gave him mixed feelings, though it did not matter anymore as it was the last thing his mind registered before plunging into darkness. No regrets mom, ah, uh, general POV. As Damien's heart stopped beating, the only sounds in the room were from the mother-daughter duo's sobs and the music coming from the earphones worn by the former. Mom uh, just killed a man, put a gun against his head pulled my trigger, now he's dead, mama, life had just begun, but now I've gone and thrown it all away, mama, ooh, didn't mean to make you cry, if I'm not back again this time tomorrow, carry on, carry on, as if nothing really matters, too late, my time has come, sends shivers down my spine, body's aching all the time, goodbye, everybody, I've got to go, gotta leave you all behind and face the truth, mama. Ooh, I don't want to die. A Tale of Steel and Gunpowder Chapter 42 by Pixie Tokaizaki 14 Chapter 42, Teary Goodbye Nira was busy contemplating how to procure the ingredients needed to produce smokeless powder. She didn't realize her father had walked inside the forge to open it up. Oh, Nira, I was just about to open the shop today, her father said as he put on his apron. Dad, I have something to tell you. I think Ellie already told Mom about this. Nira said while she held her hands. What is it? Marcus asked, approaching his daughter. Since me and Deli are now sea rank adventurers, we can now take escort quests. Our plan was to travel to Eris and from there take another escort quest to the capital. That way we can make some money while we are traveling. Nira explained. I see, Marcus said as he placed his hand on Nira's shoulder. Me and your mother knew you two would have to explore the world one day the moment we heard you two wanted to become adventurers. In fact, that's how me and your mother met my little smith, he said while he called Nira by the nickname he gave her. You met mom during an escort quest, and you were an adventurer? Nira asked with an eyebrow raised. No. It's more like after the escort quest when we were tired. Your mother was the innkeeper at the time, and I fell in love when I first saw her. Yes, I was a B-rank adventurer before I settled down with Mirable, 
he said with a small smile. I see, Nira said understandingly. Since you're leaving in two days, want to supervise the shop one last time? He said with a soft smile. Sure, Dad, Nira replied as she went up and grabbed her apron, which was hanging on the wall to her right. The rest of the day was just like the many shop days from her childhood. Nira didn't know, but Marcus had a tear in his eye when they finished. It was already night as Marcus prepared to leave the cleaning to Nira, as he always had done. Before he left, he turned to Nira one last time for the day and said, Remember to visit us when you ever get back in town, alright? Sure, Dad, me, and Ellie will, Nira said. Her dad nodded and left the forge to go to sleep. Nira then proceeded to clean the entire forge, and after she was done, it looked brand new. Before bed, Nira crafted all the ammunition she could carry using the same process of making brass cartridges using the roller attachment to her electric motor. By the end, she had 43.44 Magnum cartridges for her revolver and 54.44 Henry cartridges. Nira also used all of the crystallized doom slime cores she had in store to make more gunpowder for her journey along with more lead bullets to refill spent cartridges. She then packed up her electric drill inside her bag along with the drill bits and mounts on it so it would be safe in her hands. With her slightly increased strength compared to a normal male, she was certain she'll be able to lift all of it. Nira was exhausted afterwards and sank into a deep sleep later that night. The next morning, Nira and Ellie woke up, ate the breakfast prepared by their mother, and went to the Adventure Guild to find an escort quest that would lead them to Eris. While looking at the quest board, I noticed a pair of familiar faces. Edwina, Mari, good morning, Nira said, and the two turned in her direction. As she smirked, good morning to you as well, Nira, Mari said, I guess you two also want to get a quest this morning, Ellie said while she looked at the board, yeah. Preferably an escort quest to the elven capital. Mari here was feeling a bit homesick. Edwina said as she pointed her thumb at said blonde elf. I see. What about your shop, Edwina? Nira asked. Don't worry, I already hired some people to manage it while I'm gone. That brings me to you too. Also taking an escort quest? Edwina said. Yeah, we're heading towards Eris so we can get an escort quest there to the capital. Nira explained. The group was so busy conversing that they hadn't noticed a hooded figure that wore a white hood with golden trims. Nira, good morning, said the hooded figure as it approached Nira. Good morning to you as well, but who are you? Nira said, puzzled as to who this person would be. Did you already forget me? The figure said as it revealed to Nira who it was by letting the hood over her face. Ah, Amiria, I didn't realize because of the hood, Nira said while the two other adventurers looked at her in shock. The Lady Amiria, the s rank archer that took down a dragon? Mari said with her jaw opened wide. Good heavens, I wasn't alone in that fight. I had three other A-rankers when we took on that adult class dragon, Amiria said as her eyes rolled to the side. You didn't tell us that, Amiria? Ellie said while she had her arms crossed and one eye closed, looking at Amiria. Well, you two never asked so. Amiria replied with a cheeky smile. Incredible. Lady Amiria, here? I'm dreaming. Am I? What brought you here? Edwina frantically said with stars in her eyes. I was deployed to aid in the problem of the monster horde that you all had to deal with a while back. We found the source and destroyed it with the help of Nira and Ellie here. She explained but did not mention the foe they fought that night, and due to some things I will not disclose, I'm now assigned to Nira as her party member before said issue can be resolved, Amiria explained, to which Mari and Edwina replied with puzzled expressions. You're so lucky, Nira, you get to have Lady Amiria with you as your party member, I'm so jealous, Edwina said as she faked crying, yeah, anyway, we should get going. I found a good quest that has a reward of 25 gold coins if we complete the escort, Ellie said as she ripped parchment paper from the board. Agreed, good luck on your journey, Edwina and Mari, Nira said with a smile. You as well, Nira, Mari replied with a small smile of her own. Amiria, Nira, and Ellie separated from Edwina and Mari as they proceeded to the guild front desk to confirm the quest. Amiria put her hood back on to not draw any attention. After the guild maid puts the stamp on it, they leave at dawn tomorrow, which gave the party ample time to prepare, like buying extra food rations as well as extra canteens and bags to hold everything that they would use. The next day, at dawn, the twins were about to set off, as their parents were already waiting outside the house to say their goodbyes. 
The sun was peeking from the horizon, casting an orange shade over the place. Mofu was busy sleeping inside the bag that Nera carried, but woke up when they were about to say their goodbyes. Good luck, you two, and remember to pay us a visit whenever you two are back in town, Mirable said with tears in her eyes, watching the two girls they nurtured grow up and be ready to go on their own journey. Yeah, mom, I'll make sure to take care of Nira, Ellie said with a soft smile. You too, Nira. Good luck. And here, I made this for you if you ever find a forge to work your weapons, Marcus said as he pulled out a smithing hammer with a custom-made handle with intricate markings and a symbol that depicted her revolver and rifle in an X pattern hammered on the head side. Nira thought he must have made this yesterday when they were selecting the escort quest. Thanks, Dad, Nira said as she held the hammer with her hands and placed it inside the bag she was carrying. And this is for you, Ellie. Mirable said as she handed Ellie a leather bandolier that was designed to carry throwing knives. Ellie slowly took the bandolier from her mother and placed five throwing knives on it before wearing it on her belt. Thanks mum. Ellie said as both she and Nira hugged their respective parents tightly. Mofu got out of the bag, and his secondary colors changed to blue as he licked both of their parents with his ears and tail drooping. We'll miss you too, Mofu, Marcus said as he patted Mofu's head. Mofu. He slowly said while he jumped back on top of Nira's bag. Good luck on your journey, Marcus said as he hugged Nira. They let go, as they were now being called to gather near the city gates to meet with the merchant they were going to escort. The twins then walked away with their bodies still facing home, waving goodbye to Mirable and Marcus. Both parties had tears in their eyes as the two parents saw their daughters turn the corner and out of sight.